Welcome to everyone to the um, our final NORAD session for 2020. Uh, this year's sessions, as most of you know, um, you have the, the, the slide up of, of our um, uh, sessions and uh, they've been reorganized this year into the uh, uh, master architecture and engineering series um, for this year. Each one has been what I had intended uh, from the start, um, uh, NORAD years, many years ago, um, and they continue to uh, be a success. Um, I hope um, next year to um, uh, return, um, uh, hopefully back to the office, but even if we do return back to the office, uh, we will continue to um, uh, televise these to the uh, other NOR offices in Ottawa, uh, Calgary, Chicago, uh, Detroit, Philadelphia, uh, and Sacramento, as well as the UK offices. Uh, I think it's been very successful with the other offices and we'll continue to do that if and when we return, uh, not I shouldn't say if, uh, when we return back to our offices. For today, uh, this is the last of um, the year and in some ways, uh, this session is going to wrap up what I think that we've done uh, through uh, most of the sessions and and the sessions this year have concentrated on an approach to architecture and, and engineering in four main areas. Research, innovation, the environment and inspiration. And we've concentrated on the works of the past and current leaders, Eero Saarinen, Lorenzo Piano, Florence Knoll, Mike Pico, Lloyd Keller, David Bowick, Antoine Chaya. And today, to conclude the year, we are honored to have with us Stefano Pugliati. Stefano Pugliati uh, was born and raised in northern eastern Italy, and I won't give you the year because I don't think he wants everybody to know how old he is. Yeah, so <laughs> he earned the architecture diploma from uh, IVAV Instituto Universitario di Architettura di Venezia and a Master's of Architecture from the science architecture in Los Angeles. He is currently the head and director of Elastico Farm in Chiri, Italy, uh, which is just outside of Turino, and in with an office in Toronto, Canada. Parallel to his professional career, Stefano carries on personal and academic research on climate and architecture and has been teaching at the Politecnico di Torino in Italy and IVAV in Venice, Italy and at the University of Toronto in Canada. Stefano Pugliati is also the creative di director of the Italian architecture and design category of the Italian Contemporary Film Festival in Toronto. Stefano's main research focus on the relationship between forces and elements of nature and the built environment. Joining us from just outside Turino, Italy today is Stefano Bugliardi. But before I turn this over to Stefano, I'd like to say a few words about him. I met Stefano a few years ago um, with the Italian Contemporary Film Festival this year. I became a member of, of the committee and uh, learned quite a bit about okay. Stefano. And I'm certainly sorry that I missed the session that he had at the University of Toronto uh, a few years ago. Last week, we had a dry run of his presentation and without giving away very much, uh, this presentation is really a lot about experimentation. It's about research, innovation, the environment, and it's truly inspirational architecture. I will leave it at that and turn this session over to Stefano Pugliati to share <coughs> his unique approach to architecture. Stefano Pugliati. Thank you very much, Silvio. Uh, it's an honor to be here speaking with you. 
with all of you and uh, uh, I go forward. OK, speaking to all of you and introducing my work. It's real honor and uh, and I hope uh, I will be clear enough because uh, as you understand, it, uh, Italian is my first language. I don't speak better Italian than English, but anyway, but English is not my first language. So sometimes I get uh, confused with words and uh, I hope uh, at the end of the day you will understand it. Um, and forgive me. So I start always, a uh, lot of my work is very, auto what I, I talk about is very autobiographical and I will explain you my passion, my obsessions <coughs> and my attention to some some aspects of architectures that sometimes are uh, misunderstood and sometimes we are fighting against them while we could uh, use them in our work. I always show this, uh, this uh, herd of cattle because uh, I think that our projects are like this herd of cattle. They are also very similar, some are different, but uh, genetically they come from the same, uh, same, la same line. Sometimes we introduce new blood into our projects, new people coming in, new, new um, uh, how you say, collaborations, and uh, this makes uh, the herd better. It makes it grow better. Our, our projects are somehow all genetically connected, but they are willing to, we are willing to improve the herd. Um, I start uh, saying that I got uh, my first diploma in Venice uh, and uh, this is the best uh, uh, view I can have of Venice, so the best image I can show you of Venice. And it's very important for me, this not for the cathedral, not, not for, um, but for, for the Piazza San Marco flooded. This is very a very important uh, observation I did in my life one, one day while I was uh, with my wet pants uh, and uh, and I understood that uh, the guy that was putting down the line where this that uh, passerelle where people is walking actually was deciding for everybody how they could perceive a, a, a space and a building that generally is perceived just from the open space moving freely. So that moment told me a lot about uh, how water can change the perception and can change the space and the way you have to understand. And I always thought that water is actually considered by architects the biggest enemy. We build, we build against water. We, we water comes from the from the top on the roofs, and we have to protect it. it comes from from sides, come from uh, from the bottom uh, through capillarity, and uh, we are always fighting that. Uh, somehow. Uh, I, I try to use it instead instead of fighting it, and I try always to find the way to make it become part of architecture. Not always, but as much as I can. And it's uh, to me quite uh, interesting to figure out when when you think about that that the place where there is the the biggest festival of architecture, the biggest event in architecture in the world is Venice, the place where I I, I like to say that water and architects finally get in peace for a few days. But my attention to water and to and to the natural forces come from my my uh, passion for art and especially Arte Povera, which is based here in Torino, which was born here in Torino, is a conceptual, is a branch of conceptual art. And we have some uh, great artists. Uh, uh, it's called Arte Povera after the name was, was given uh, after a, a show at MoMA. So uh, it's uh, uh, this. This, for example, is a work. This talk about the torsion, something that uh, uh, somehow many many centuries before was already part of uh, of art. And when we see this figure, somehow what really makes uh, the this cobble, what makes it really important, is not as much how well it's it's sculptured, but the tension and the fact that is very, very similar to what we see in in the in the in the previous picture. And the other thing that uh, another work of Giovanni Anselmo that is really I always show to my to my students when I when I start teaching or when I have some courses is this that is called the breath. If you see this this uh, this slide and you see between this this two bars of metal, you see a small piece of sponge. That sponge actually contracts and uh, expands with the, with the contraction and expansion of the bar, of this uh, uh, steel bar. 
And as architects and engineers, we all know we have a lot to do with that, with that dilatation and with that expansion. And that's another force that we somehow uh, so like to, to, to consider into our projects. I go on uh, uh, with my, uh, I start from very far because I want to, to, to show you how actually the themes I'm working on now and I've always been working on are actually part of my research from the for day one when I started to understand what I was interested in architecture. And uh, uh, this is my thesis of um, for uh, SciArc in uh, California. SciArc was the school where all the deconstructivist movement uh, came from, so all went to. Somehow we had uh, uh, teachers like uh, Tom Main, uh, Michael Rotondi from Morphosis, or um, uh, Frank Stepper and Wolf Briggs from Cop Himmenblau. Uh, Frank Gehry was always there. Um, um, Zadid came to visit a lot. So it was one of very progressive schools. The summary of my thesis, because they are the summary of what I've been doing. So that's this is what it is. The project, my project is located in Venetian Lagoon, one of the most unstable areas of the world. In an area which is constantly changing in every level, at every level. Forces of nature shape the topography and the geology of the place. Human forces often uh, fought against them, against them, but together with uh, uh, together they are constantly defining new borders and new activities. The forces present the forces present in the place have been considered by myself as shaping forces and the intent of my thesis has been to work with them, trying to re-establish or repropose a relationship between artificial and natural, between function and use, between history and present, leaving a door open to the future. Well, I found out this little short, uh, short uh, writing just a few days ago when I was preparing another lecture on water, talking about water for, uh, uh, for the, uh, the architect order of vent. So it was very important to speak to Venetians about water. So very, very, very had to be very careful. And I found out that, and I put it at the beginning. And I thought I thought to it again because that's actually the start and the present of my. Of my uh, so that that thesis was talking about this village that now you see as a, a vacation place with with all this cultivation of uh, umbrellas of. But actually, the beginning we saw of all of this was a big lagoon with a, a small city that is here. I don't know if you see my, my what what I was saying is that the, this city was a, a a Venetian city, and as all the Venetian city had some channels inside. Where you see these red spots, these are were some, the areas where the, we had some channels, and now they became streets. They are called the Rio Terra. So the, it means uh, the river that has been covered with earth. So, um, so what, what I thought is to bring back the feeling of the water into the building without bringing it into the city, without bringing the, to actually bringing the, uh, the water. So I threw some uh, communicating pipes, how you know, the vases, the, the, the uh, I, I, Kind of brought the high tides and the low tides of the of the sea into this into the city, but just having some platform floating into the city. So if we have some, uh, uh, the level of the sea is lower than the level of the earth now, and with the, some pipes we filled some uh, some big let's say tank with a with a with a top a floating top, and this floating top would move into the city. Making people understand that uh, that the water that they cannot see from the inside of the city because it is on the other side of the cliff has uh, is is actually moving the earth behind them. This was uh, something very conceptual, and maybe I'm not very good in explaining it now. But uh, in uh, somehow I can show how this uh, the small building changed the shape with uh, with that, and we had some models. This model, for example, you see that this building has a base that floats and moves and changes the section of the city of the of the building. So 
I was trying somehow to use the energy of the water, this movement of the water, to change the section of this building and to change the way the way the the public space is used. So 20 years after, 25 years after that thesis, uh, I um, I got the opportunity to design a project in Grado, which is now I show you the slide is a little bit eastern of where we were, but still in a place where the earth is very soft as I call it, is again in the middle of a lagoon in a place where the people goes to the seaside. And we had to design some thermal baths here on the middle between this uh, park and the beach and the water. And uh, as you see, the beaches here are very sandy and very long. If uh, I go swimming there to be able not to touch the ground, I need to do a kilometer probably into the water because it's very flat, very, very, very soft. But if you look uh, in the in this part of the picture, you see Croatia and this all this coast here is a, is made of cliff of buffs and uh, and it's a very much richer place and even more, much more beautiful. So there is always kind of a, an envy, in my opinion, in my in my vision of our beaches for those beaches that are much the water is looks much cleaner even if it's the same water but uh, the, the there is no sand but there is rock so it's uh, is more is is more romantic as a, as a place so um, so i started thinking about uh, working making a a building that was like speaking about this envy that we have in the Italian side toward the Croatian side where they have a much better a much better kind of seaside much more romantic kind of seaside so my idea was designing a piece of uh, uh, of artificial cliff where people well, where people could lay and go use it as a uh, as a um, as a uh, how you say thermal baths sorry the thermal bath there is a history in uh, grado about thermal baths because that's where where the the um, the emperor of austria used to go bathing and having his thermal bath because the the water is really very salty so it's a the use of salt on the bathing makes it particularly healthy and the sands using the sand uh, to as a therapeutic uh, element. But so in this image, again, you will see uh, how our project was dealing with the this park that is in the, ba in the back uh, is Park of the Roses and the, and the beach. And we created this artificial cliff and where we were with there in the right where the sand, the sand uh, pitches were to go to to, to have this uh, therapeutic uh, event uh, treatments while on the left we have the real thermal bath and uh, um, I show just model pictures because I don't want to you are all architect and engineers so you have every day to deal with architectural drawing engineer drawing and blah blah and uh, you know more than me about that I speak what all about what comes before and what comes after my work so this was the idea and the model developed on the idea. We got to the uh, to to the level with this project. We got to the level of the uh, um, definitive drawings. So we submitted all the definitive drawings. Then uh, the then the politics changed in the in the town and uh, the new politics decided not to do this project and and they hired someone else to do another project that of course is not as good as ours. I'm joking, but I don't know how it is. I will never go there uh, because it was uh, we put a lot of passion on that and uh, we got a little bit of a delusion. Uh, so this uh, this is what the project was on and everybody actually we won some prizes for this project and the city was really forward looking forward to have it. So they still call me sometimes to to for other things because uh, they, they like the, the approach and they like the project that was really organic into into this uh, landscape that was really artificial 
And uh, this is the side of the building that looks toward the city. And this side of the building you see is much softer, is much rounder. And it used, uh, and it's all this building is built with bricks. And there is a strong reason why it's built with brick, because all these lands are clay and sand. And so is the land, all the city, all Venice and all the islands around Venice are built with bricks. So we wanted to, to use the same material, even because there are some characters of that material that are really, really interesting. And, uh, uh, and, uh, so, and you, I will explain them later. But going back to my thesis, if you see this, this is the section of the building that connects somehow the, the park that is on the right, that would be on the right, with the beach that would be on the left. Uh, you, you will see that uh, uh, all we, uh, the, the, the building uses the water from the sea. So the water from the sea gets pumped into the, into the building and creates different ponds of water inside where people can go get the, the, with different levels of uh, salt inside. After the use, the water has to be pumped again to the, to the, to the sea and after being treated. So what we thought that would be interested instead of pumping the water to the, to the, to the sea, to the sea, we would fill some tanks, some big uh, ponds again underneath the building and making some floating platforms on that. Everybody knows that, uh, or everybody, I think everybody knows that uh, the, the, the tides on the sea change every seven hours. And the seven hours are the, the, the moon cycle, uh, it belongs to the moon cycle, while the people moves with the sun cycle. And the sun cycle is built of 24 hours, so six, is, you can divide it in six, but you cannot divide it in seven. It, it, this means that is, there are two clocks that are not, not coordinated. It means that uh, if you have a high tides at seven o'clock in the morning, the day after, at seven o'clock in the morning will not be the same height. And because the position of the moon will be different towards this, the earth. So what meant, this meant is that this section, this place where my mouse is, is go, was gonna change this section every, every day differently. And everyone who was gonna use that place was gonna have a completely different, a, a completely different feeling about this place. And at the same time, when the, the low tides would come, it would empty the empty without any energy cost. It would empty all the the, uh, the ponds, the the pools. So that's uh, that's uh, how I kind of brought what was just a thought during my studies into reality, and it became even technologically it was already uh, developed the project. And uh, uh, it, the, the, the people, the engineers that were working with us were very happy about working on that way because we were saving somehow money that we could use in other, in other things. Another thing that this building, uh, that belongs to this building is a, th a thought about materiality. This is a work of Cesario Carena, who was one of the people I worked with and was one of my masters. He, is an he was an architect, but Overall, he was an artist, and he. This work is about capillarity. You see, this uh, this uh, pots of water with some clay sticks that uh, that are dipped into that, and the water and the some seeds planting on the top of the of the of the of the clay and uh, of this uh, terracotta stuff, and it. The, the, there is a growth of this because it means that humidity through capillarity goes up. If you think to Venice, Venice is all built on bricks and Venice, all the stucco comes out from the houses from for three, four meters. You get because the, the brick sucks up all the humidity and the salt and the salt. You can see white walls that show it very strongly. That's what we wanted to do in this building. We were looking for that effect. We actually thought that as this building was talking about salt, as the main function was using salt, salt had to become part of the construction. And with all the risk that salt creates in the building, we did some studies on that. We wanted the cladding of the building, something that 
can somehow fade, be, become very real and going into the water and sucking up all the salt which would be depositing on the facade. This is what only theoretical, but that again, the, we always put something, the, uh, something of research in that that can come out in other projects later. We were so uh, willing to do that, that we protected the top of the, we wanted to protect the salt from being washed away. So we had a stone top on that. The contrary of what generally happens in the building where you put the stone on the bottom because it, so that it doesn't suck up the, the water. So we, we wanted to do it differently and to, to have salt this building to change with time and to become richer and stronger with time. Again, I'm very sad when I see these pictures because we wish we wish that we could go forward with that. And talking about capillarity, I'm going to present this work that we did with uh, KFA. And we presented with uh, we presented at uh, Edit that was this event that we that was held in uh, in Toronto at uh, the Unilever factory, ex Unilever factories, and uh, and uh, we were asked to make an installation. And I was talking about uh, somehow uh, how we, we see uh, sustainability and how the bear actually is the representative of sustainability. But the bear actually lays. Uh, is in, in danger, a white bear is in dangerous peace nowadays because there is oil. And uh, rich countries like Canada, US, Russia, whatever, somehow contributes to put the white bear in danger, even if there are a lot of action that are at, at, at a different level. Of course, Canada in a different level than US and of Russia, but oh, we everybody who owns a little bit of the North Pole has a responsibility. So in that beautiful space of the, the silo, in one of the silos of the Unilever, we flood, we flooded one, the room with some uh, exhausted oil and we landed in them an origami of, uh, of um, white Carrara marble that was laying into the, the oil. And um, the white Carrara marble has a property that is very porous and it sucks up the, the, the fluid that where it's, it was laying. And so our intent was that this bear was going to become black bear. And that is like, is not, and the title of the work is We Are the Bear. So don't get worried for the bear, get worried for ourselves because that's our big deal. Uh, the big deal is against what we are doing. We are not doing it against the bear, but we're doing it against ourselves. And that was just an installation. But again, it was talking about uh, this idea of sustainability that sometimes is fake. Is there is a lot of greenwashing and uh, we have to be responsible and to take a lot of care of that. We, I would not like to be associated with that idea of greenwashing. I prefer even when we, we talk about insulation of the buildings, I would like really to understand how that happens and what, what we are doing to the future, what will happen to all that insulation, all that uh, uh, synthetic uh, production of material that one day will be in our planet, poisoning the future of our kids, our nephews or whatever. So, uh, this this was just a statement to talk about how now I I approach and some project in which we approach uh, sustainability or at least uh, we attempt to approach sustainability in a certain way. And this project was a, a, was a, was somehow a big mistake which brought me back to thinking about uh, sustainability in a in a out of the box way maybe. I don't know, but somehow in a way that I was not, I personally was not expecting at the moment. So we had to restore this building and we were asked to do a big store. So the, the, the thing is that we have to restore this building and every, this was in 2003 and it's in Chieri where I live. And uh, Chieri is in Piemonte, it's a big, this big region toward France. And, uh, and we were like, playing with renderings and uh, we say, OK, we make a big greenhouse, beautiful greenhouse. Everybody from the from the from the street can see inside the, the building and uh, it's going to be nice. We keep 
part of the building there, so it's an historical, so we will not have problem with the, with the city, and uh, we, we work on that. Something every architect does, and everybody, all of us think to be very original doing that, but we are not. And somehow this, this was to us like a, a, a good idea, till the moment that the, uh, how you say, the engineer that the talk, uh, the mechanical engineer came at play and looked at us and said, guys, we are doing a flower store. Flower store is, uh, and we have a building that is orientated northwest. Northwest is very bad orientation. You can see that in the win in the summer, while in the winter this is pretty cold, in the summer this takes sun from two o'clock in the afternoon till eight o'clock in the evening, nine o'clock in the evening at our latitude. So this roof and glass facade is going to be an over, create an oven inside. So we will need to use a lot of air conditioning, which would be not good at all for the, for the plants. And in that speaking, uh, he said the only day it's going to work in summer is when it rains. And that was a kind of an interesting sentence because we started thinking that maybe that's what we have to do to make it rain a lot. And so we thought that that facade could be cladded with water, protected by water, and we had we were lucky enough to have into the building, that's what, how the idea came, we had an, a, a well into the building that could not be used because it was, it, there was lots, too many chemicals, it's in the middle of the city, so it's not healthy to use that water. So we thought about using, filtering that water, using that water to cool down the facade, collect it again, pump it again to the facade, and in that way we were achieving a, a cold, colder space into the inside, and we could, we were at the same time, we were at the same time uh, providing something that we were not expecting. Actually, we were, this is the detail, the drawing, we act, what we were actually doing was creating a urban fountain. That water flowing on the facade was creating a noise and the noise that the noise of water insulates a lot from the from uh, from the noises and at the same time it creates a, an effect of uh, of um, it gives the building uh, it, it create the no, it, it protects a lot and it give freshness to the to the place. So that facade that generally in summer is hit by sun, it becomes a very fresh place. A lot of mistakes happen in doing that because we were very experimental. We just built it. And uh, and as you see, there is water on the floor and then we, we solved later. There were a lot of little mistakes that we did that taught us a lot of how, how to use this material, how to do different things with water and how to use water to protect the building from, from the heat. At the same time, this is a, a, a nice shot that shows, uh, that, that shows how it works. At the same time, uh, in the interior, the space is completely new, is uh, filtered by this, this screen that uh, in, a, how, how can we say, the, that uh, this filter is, create curiosity to the people that wants to go inside. So it was a very successful commercial move. And uh, it's still, still nowadays past 12 years from when we started it, 13 years from when we started it, and it's still working and still, and they still, <coughs> they still do a little bit of intervention to, to keep, to clean the, the, the glasses or whatever, but even the, the calcium that deposits on the facade makes is making the building uh, much more interesting than, than at the beginning. Now I'm going to talk to you about another form of water. That's snow. You know it very well in, uh, in Toronto. And uh, I would like to introduce you, for those that don't, don't know him, Andy Goldsworthy work. Andy Goldsworthy is an artist from uh, Scotland. And he made this work that to me is really, really very interesting because snow is not something uh, abstract, it's something very concrete. If you compact snow and uh, time, uh, time passes, even in the heat, it can stay, it's, it, it's, it keeps its cold, uh, it's keep, it keeps its uh, being a snowball. And this is a midsummer snowball, this is a work he did in London. 
And uh, to me, that's uh, that idea that snow is not something is something that lives and the, the form you give to the snow somehow defines how uh, it how long it will resist, how long it will live, how long it will stay with us as that form not melting into water. Uh, became interesting when we got to work in a, in a project in the Italian Alps. Again, we go to the east and the, we are up in the, in the mountain is a, in a ski area in which that was developed in the 60s. It was like a, a place where there was no, no real village in the beginning. In the 60s, they decided to build this place, build up this place. And, uh, and uh, because it was, there was a lot of snow and there was those nice hills, nice uh, cliffs to, to ski. And they built, uh, they built around that, but somehow with, without the culture for the snow. So you see this round roof here. It's uh, it's now we are restoring that building too. That's our project. Next project we are working on. But uh, we uh, this building uh, this building is like it's always leaking. It's never working well. In that place comes two three meters of snow in in good season. So it means that the pressure that the, those beams are subject to is huge, and so. When they gave us this project, they, they were very, very worried about that. They were very worried of giving us a project on the snow and we didn't have an experience of that. And uh, we had to make a hotel on top of this or tearing down this yellow, yellow building. We decided not to tear it down. We took away just a part of it. We used the basement of it to, to, to throw the, it had two levels of basement. The, the first level of basement that reached the, the rock was useful for us because we put all the the everything that we the, the demolition stuff we put it on the real basement because that had no use so we saved a lot of money on bringing bringing the ruins down to to um, to the to the flatland and uh, and um, and we started to think about the value of water so we told them look what uh, of uh, snow is not a problem is a resource that's why we are here. That's what we have to work with in our projects. That's one of the uh, materials we want to work with in the project. That's how we convince them for the project. And we designed what we did actually. We designed a roof and the building is a roof. It is all thought to be a roof to protect and to use water, snow and to somehow um, uh, to, be, to, to have an evocative use and celebrating the snow. And this is how the project works. What's the project? It talks about snow. It makes snow stay in some parts, flow away in some other parts. And this somehow it works like the mountain does. The mountain is excavated by snow, is excavated by water. The water flows and it creates things. We realized that only when we finished it, that we realized that the two images were very similar. And so snow became, uh, became the element with which we decided to shape the, the building, creating, allowing it to go away, making it stay a little bit longer in some place and making it go fast in other places and uh, creating, becoming an event for the building. So snow is part of the building is an element of the building and in summer water is a part of the building because water flows in these facades, stops in some parts and I will show you later and becomes uh, like a, a waterfall in others. So for example, in this part, you see these small icicles that they come, started to, to come out and that icicle can be very dangerous if you don't think about that. But if you think about that and you create a big uh, stone area where people cannot walk in, and underneath the stone area, we, you create a, a, a cistern where the water, where the collect, where the melted snow or the water in summer goes, and then gets pumped to the lakes on top of the hills to produce snow when there is no snow. That becomes this roof becomes somehow a, a, an element to collect uh, to collect uh, water and to celebrate water and snow. And another thing that I want to talk about is uh, how, what we did uh, technologically in this building for, uh, uh, how you say, mechanical 
heating of the building. We used, you saw that uh, round building, that uh, curved building, curved the roof building. I showed you before, that's a nice skating ring. So we used the cold, but that's very easy for, probably for, uh, for people like you that have big projects and work on that. Anyway, for us it was like a discovery too, to use the, 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 the loss energy to produce the loss, loss heat to produce uh, to produce the ice got, got used into this building to heat the hotel. So we, we produce ice, what we generally before was thrown away, got into this the system to heat the building. And this ice cycle, you, as you can see, becomes part of the building, becomes an important part of the building, becomes a celebration of water and and uh, and uh, snow. Another uh, building. I, I will. I don't show you the interior. The interior is a is a nice hotel. Is a four star hotel. It's okay. Uh, but uh, what I want to speak to you about now is a project in Toronto. A project that unfortunately we were not able to go forward. We got to the again to the to to the final point before starting. But then there were some problems. And we we could not uh, start the project. It's a project that is very dear to me, for two reasons: because uh, um, it's part of a nice history, a nice story, that brings us to to a, 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 our future project we are using, we are doing with KFA. And this project was done with KFA, and uh, um, a project for the um, native people of Manitouling Island where we are designing uh, a school for film, for filmmaking, so that the young guys can uh, use the school to recover, to rediscover their culture. And doing that, we are learning a lot about the culture. And we are somehow, that building is going to be the daughter of this experimental research that we did in this building. I hope I was clear on that. Anyway, I was very impressed when I came to Toronto, what, watching some books and, and seeing this uh, this fire that happened, I think, in um, in uh, Montreal. And uh, and this fire was like, uh, of course, you all know that they, they pumped the water on the building and the, 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 the water froze and the, the effect was this. This effect is to me, it was very interesting for two things because there's, there's, the, it added a layer to the building and it somehow created this fading, this blurring on the building and changing somehow the building. And this was uh, an interesting image that I used a lot when I was talking. I taught to, for two years at UFT, uh, talking about climate and architecture. So this building is on the beaches. You all know. I don't want to tell you what it is the beaches, but from what I understood, the beaches is the place where in ancient, in older time, they used to go to get fresh in summer, but uh, people was not living a lot. And there were more summer houses um, because it's fresh. But from my understanding, it's very fresh even in winter. I was there in 2015 and it was really, really fresh. It was cold, really cold. So uh, we started working on this project that year. And uh, I was very impressed by the code. And the lot we were designing was this lot here that you see in uh, in uh, in blue. And uh, what I want to point out is the typology of building that go exist in uh, now in the beaches, apart from the condos, is the this small traditional house that is very protected with small window with you know, bay window and uh, some verandas in front to protect the layers of protection of the building and the new buildings that look to me like uh, Venice Beach and uh, uh, that building that surely are ma use a lot of energy and uh, somehow or use a lot of technology and uh, to protect themselves from the cold. But they look, they, the look is more modern. So we, we were thinking there's something good on both of these things, but there's something on both of these things that is not adequate for what we think should be a building there. This, the one on the left, is beautiful, but it somehow belongs to the past. So people want to have a, a more straight relation with nature. The one on the right is not the most proper thing for climate. So 
we were we started analyzing the building, the lot, and the lot is oriented. The main facade of the lot, this this lot, this facade here, is oriented northwest. The northwest facade is the same problem in Italy, same latitude than Florence. Toronto is the same latitude of Florence. It's like this. Uh, this facade in summer is very hot and in winter is very cold. But very cold in Canada is not very cold in Italy. So, um, so this is how the shadow study show the building in summer. You see from after 12 o'clock at one o'clock, two o'clock, it gets the sun starts hitting it for all the afternoon. And while in summer it's completely, uh, completely, completely uh, blinded by by shadow. And what we wanted to do is protect in summer. So we created this grid. So we have big windows you see on the bottom. We have some smaller window and some bigger window behind, protected by a screen of mesh, of metal mesh. But we, at a certain point, we said, what happens to that in winter? We don't have light, we don't get sun, we have this protection of the windows. And what, what do you use this mesh for? Why do, and it came to my mind, this image about how, a, uh, how farmers protect the gem from freezing when in springtime cold arrives, unexpectedly. And uh, they spray it with water. Water creates a protection of zero degree. The interior stays zero degree. Ice create, goes around it and the gems don't die. This idea of protecting from the cold with the cold became very interesting to me. And I started thinking about that and trying to think how that same grid that protects from the cold, from the, from the, from the, the sun, could become an element that freezes, that was sprayed with water. And we, I called it the broken gutter. Somehow the gutters on top could have could use this grid to get the water down in summer, but at the same time could be sprayed with water in winter when it freezes, creating a crust of uh, of um, of ice. We went on thinking about that. We worked with that with some engineers, both in Italy and in Canada, and uh, we developed. Uh, uh, we understood what the image that we were getting it. So at the beginning, we were fascinated most of all by the image, although we understood that behind this image there could be something even more interesting that, of course, need to be tested and need to be figured out. But this, our idea was that that of the gem, protecting from the cold with the cold. And that's some studies, rough studies, about using the dispersed heat into this buffer between the outside iced wall and the inside as well. Does it work? I hope so. I don't know. But <clears throat> the idea was trying to push a little bit into that direction. And so being able to hit the house in the inside just from zero or from minus two up and not from minus 15, minus 16, minus 20. So these were some experiments on how that we did at KFA on the rooftop of the building in Toronto last winter. Uh, before I came to Italy, I was locked here to uh, to test how the, the water flows and how high it can be. I'm in the back of the image there. So that was a starting of the experiment that and then this is what how I designed personally designed the interior of the spaces. I relate with the, you see the grid here on the window how the space is broken in many places because the family was a three people family. So many things that's architecture. That's what we always talk. That's where we put our taste, our history, our say, but I'm not going to talk too much about that. The section is split level section, the garden, whatever. This is the model. This is the idea from the street on Kelly Wall Street in summer. And this was the idea of from Kennewood Street in winter. Okay, um, I uh, can go. I go on now speaking about another aspect of uh, architecture that we try to work in, which is linked to materiality and structure. 
I was impressed by this uh, show that was in Brescia a few months ago about uh, by Jan Juan Navarro Baldevec, a very good architect in an artist in from Spain. He made this circle and suspended it with this string here. But you see the string is not exactly in the center. And the circle, when you see it, looks very strange. Of course, there is some weight that is put differently into the circle. But the first image that you get is a why does, how does that look? How is it? Why this is this confusion, this twisted in idea, idea of structure? Hanging something that is not in the very centrical from what from is not what we are used to see. And this other work from Anselmo again, that is uh, uh, visible and invisible. It's like the idea of stone, hanging stone, how it expresses the weight and the idea of weight. How and how 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 much is that architecture? There's a lot of architecture in that in those two images that I showed. I think. Or this, again, one string that holds, and this is called toward the uh, ultramare, which is the, the color, toward the blue. And this like, like this piece, this materiality of the stone, the Luzerna stone that is cut like a, uh, like a sail, and it goes toward that color. That idea of weight that is kept by this string, to me, again, was, was very interesting. So I will talk about this project. There is a restoration of a project or an, an idea of, uh, of uh, restoration of an old building that we did, uh, an old series of buildings that we did in San Quirino that is in the northeastern part of Italy again. I work a lot there because I'm from there, so people know me there, but my I live in this part here. So here he is in the west, I live in the east, and I, I live I, I, my office is one in the east, west, and uh, I travel on the Pianura Padana quite often. So this is the the, the buildings that we were we are gonna we, we made some intervention on. These first two were the two the two starting pro projects. Now we are working on these other two. But the idea was like on both those buildings. Is one different from the other. The stone in this first building, you see the stone, the stone, uh, the stone building is kept like it was, but we created inside a structure that holds the old stone. So in a, a building is like the shell, and what before was holding the roof now is held by a structure that is put inside, like a bone that holds this this thin skin outside. So the stones that were structural become just a skin. The other one, the other building, the second building, the stone becomes ornament. There is a bylaw in Italy that tells you that in building in the center, in this village, there is a bylaw in this village that tells you if you build in that village, you have to build it with stones. But we all know that's a fake thing. That's only ornament because stone is a seismic area so the seismic rules say you cannot build in stone. So what they want us is to tell lies, with the, to tell the world that we build a concrete, that we build a, a stone building while we are building a concrete building covered with a thin layer of stone. We wanted to play with that. And uh, so we said, this stone is an ornament. Let's play it with it. Let's declare it. Let's show the structure and use it and use the stone for what it is, an ornament. So we, this is the first building. So we see the old wall of the stone, of stone is, is carried on by this other element that goes inside. They don't, the, the, the concrete wall never touches the stone inside. So they just hold, the, they, they, the, the, the stone is self-holding and is connected on top with like a ring of concrete, but is all, the ring of concrete goes toward from block to block of uh, concrete, like the, the, this first drawing on the left. The second one is the concrete building that we wanted to show, and then we used the stone in a different way. We tried to use the stone as pure ornament. So the stone becomes 
is we created some kebabs of stones, but at the same time, we were very careful to use a refined technology on the roof. You see there is no gutters here. We, the, there is a gutter, so water down from down, but we, the old houses didn't have gutters. The new houses, if you see the house on the back, they have a big gutter and it's very rude, very rough. Why the, this, uh, uh, this, um, this uh, fineness of having the, the, uh, the how you say, the, the roof tiles coming to the border is something we wanted to keep. And so we, we created this, this uh, shaders on stones, declaring in a strong way that the structure was built of concrete. And the stones were actually only, and only we had a lot of problem with that because they, they didn't want us to go that way, but we did and then we won and uh, we did. Our, our client was very good. So we, th this is some spaces of that building. And these are how we started creating this kebab of stone, the stone kebab, we call it. And uh, first roughly doing them and then building them in a much more appropriate way. And that's how the gutter, the detail of the gutter that you, you see in this drawing creates this, the, this element. So we were very careful to be much more uh, respectful of tradition than what generally people is on the important things, not on the fact that a building has to be cladded with stone. And the, what was interesting is the effect of the stone from the inside. So if you look at that, you see that the stone, the inside, you see the stone, the, 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 the stone gets sh sh shaded and in, while at night, the stone becomes part, becomes part of, becomes a wall. While, when it, before it's a sh shader, in, 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 in the night is a, is a wall. And during the night, the, from the outside, it looks like a shader. So it's, it changes his, uh, the perception inside outside changes a lot the, the idea of the house and this was a surprise for us we couldn't prevent it and now we know it and we are going to use it probably in other things but again these small houses are good experiment for us to bring in bigger building now again speaking about structure and speaking about material i'm going to talk to you about uh, granite and how i was asked by a firm a, a, a quarry to go and uh, work on one of their materials, uh, on their quarries, to somehow use in a different way uh, material. There is a strong link of this project with Toronto because working on this project, actually, I came to Toronto because I became friend of a good uh, of a good friend that works with material and and then introduced me to to Enzo that is now listening to us from Toronto. And, uh, and uh, we work together in, the, in this uh, idea of using material in different ways. At the same point, we were in the quarry and we built up these things with rocks. And we understood the uh, granite, Sardinia granite, that in Italy is considered a very poor stone that is generally used for tombs <coughs> or for cheap stair stairs in the houses. Actually, is a very powerful material, very, very powerful material and that could be used in a very interesting way. So we designed these houses for Toronto. The quarry is in Sardinia, down here. So we had to transport that from there, from there to there. But somehow it was worth trying, <coughs> doing that. And you see, this is for everybody who knows, who's familiar with Peter Eisenman, uh, um, uh, monument uh, uh, to uh, Peter Eisenman monument in Berlin. This is actually a quarry, and uh, that's what he did in his monument, and that's what I found in the quarry. This all this material with which had which had different surfaces, a different reflection of light. That was amazing to me. And what I learned is how that material is quarried. How is how is create how they cut it from the mountain. They cut it with a wire. They don't have explosion, whatever. They cut it with a wire, so they can cut it as thin as you want and as big as you want. 
of course, with uh, some proportions. And uh, the, the granite is a fantastic, uh, the, the granite from, from Sardinia is fantastic because it's a very consistent material. So you, that's why it's used a lot on, you use it a lot probably in air, airports or stations or big work because there is, is a very consistent material. You can use, have big uh, surfaces all the, that look all the same, that don't need a lot of, is very resistant, blah, 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 blah. And it was, and the Pantheon was built with, with that material. So I thought the idea of being able to cut thin slice, like in Italy, we cut polenta with a, with a wire. It was kind of interesting. And I, I got uh, one client came to me while uh, soon before coming to Toronto. And I was, uh, I was working with, uh, on this idea of the project of a project and I I had I didn't have materials yet so I started working with the business cards I had and I started putting them together and started understanding how those if those cards were coming to be uh, uh, granite slabs how that could could be working and we started making models and the first model we made the first idea of there are two houses for two sisters so the first idea was building a house that was very uh, orthogonal, uh, one slab perpendicular to other, building up the castle like in the first model. But we understood, working on that, that probably there was something we were missing. Actually, this house here, well, the two sisters, very different characters, so we used that idea to, to create two different houses. But structurally, when we started working with engineers, we understood that this this, build, this building on the left that looks simpler to build actually is much more difficult because it needs to be in a seismic area, it needs to be, there needs to be a lot of bracing around that building, steel bracing. While this building that looks much more messy, it actually holds itself much better, resists it much better to, to, the, to, the, um, to the forces coming diagonal or whatever. So we started working with this idea, with the structural idea of the project. And we started sketching it. You see in this first sketch, there are already the two, the two houses on the bottom. And I go fast. This is my drawings. This is what I do generally. And then this is what in the office we do. We start putting numbers and, and pieces together. And we created a, a concrete model that was exhibited in the Italian Institute of Culture in, in Toronto some years ago. And we started then understanding how to fill the, the, the gaps between the things. Of course, of all of this is, is uh, theoretically easy to do, but then when you start to think about water, my friend, the water, how do I use water here? How, how do I go around water? How do I try not to have leaks into the house? That's a big part of the project, but I won't tell you about that. So these are the plans, pretty easy. So it's like it's two small houses, like... Uh, uh, 2,000 2, square feet each, 1,050, 1,080, something like that. Not, not big houses in a very ugly lot of land. This is the idea of the first idea of the, the connection. This is the model again. And we started thinking about what, how do we fill the empty space? And we started thinking about how, what we want to stay and what we want to leave. So when we started then what, talking about materiality, we wanted all those labs to be granite, but we had a problem. The, the granite slabs are not EU, EU certificated. So the engineer said, we can do that. We can certificate the slabs structurally, but we need to test them. So we, it was taking a lot of time. So what we said, okay, let's cheat a little bit. We put inside some slabs in granite, in, in, uh, in, uh, in concrete, and those concrete is going to do the job somehow, do a, explain the job to the to the inspectors. While the other ones, we say that are just for feeling. That's somehow how we went around that. So we had, we, we had to put inside some some colored some um, uh, some um, concrete slabs. But at, after all, what we were interested in is the experimentation of how the material worked. So we started placing the, the slabs. Put in the the, the the how you say the horizontal slabs on top, 
and uh, that so the vertical loads are all kept by by the granite as you see then starting to connect them this moment was very emotional for us we were very worried that something cut in the in the in the quarry would not work then when in the in the place everything had to be very precisely designed but then it worked and then it started things started to get together so this is the section that has somehow explains on the right is somehow explains how th these things work and what we started thinking about uh, the empty spaces to 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 fill them with wood why wood because we thought if one day this one day this all will be a ruin there will be a sequence of materials that will rot and first first will be the glass probably then will be the then will be the um, and will be the, the the wood then probably the steel inside then all the panels will unfold down and the concrete will be that while the stone will always stay there and probably someone will find this big slab of stone in a place where there is just mud and they will wonder who who did it so the, we will, we wanted to create this idea of the future ruin so we were talking about this future ruin before doing the house you see the landscape of the sprawl is really desolating and the hour to to UFO uh, in the middle are, are creating this uh, tension into the building. I don't tell you how much talking there's been about that. These are the houses now. I go and show you the drawings fast, the pictures fast. The colors are even linked to the idea, to the fact that uh, the two ladies, the two girls that live in the house, the mother is from India and uh, and she wanted uh, her daughters to have something about color that would bring them back to India. So we we worked a little, we worked with those labs that were concrete. Why not coloring them? Why not bringing some intensity to the to the project without being so harsh on concrete? This is the interior. You see the slab go from entire side to outside and we have a buffer of uh, of uh, insulation that of a couple of meters that doesn't show the, 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 the slab so to be in the middle. So that, that it doesn't become a thermal bridge. It, it is still a thermal bridge, but much softer. We then use that same idea for a competition for a school in Palermo, but we didn't get anywhere. We wanted to use that idea of slabs in, in that competition. And then now I will explain you what uh, the the, the one before the last project, that is how that project became something bigger and how we use this project, this idea of slabs overlaid and colored, not in granite because we couldn't, in this uh, institute for, National Institute for Nuclear Physics. And we started to understand a little bit more how this panel works, how we could connect the panel, how the panel of what is generally used for factories could become something that has a value is a, even in a, can bring value into architecture. So this is a bad model, a bad uh, rendering of the building. We don't do a lot of renderings. We don't like to do renderings, and we we try mostly to work with models because they teach us more. This is the building, and this is the 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 slabs. How those bigger slabs now in concrete interact one to another, creating a colorful landscape and uh, the co court courtyards entrance uh, front door from the courtyard but what i was most interested is how it were how a, a a panel a concrete panel works i always i always watch the, this image here this image here shows that even concrete panels have a soul and that soul is actually what shows the when it when it rains shows the, the water against reveals the soul of the of the panels and it reveals it because where the, the where the where the concrete is thinner it gets wet faster or it dries slower so in this case on the left you see that the panel and even on the right the panel the where the insulation is, it stays, it stays wet more. Uh, it gets wet faster, and it shows. While 
so it, all of this effect that is a negative thing that you see in the term is I'm not explaining it correctly, but I think that most of you understand what I mean. It's like there is some insulation inside. This insulation is actually the soul of the panel, but at the same time shows the def defect of the concrete. So I thought there is a, a soul into the, the that uh, that concrete panel. That soul could be used for something. We were using uh, we were using uh, solid concrete uh, panels. So I thought maybe I could communicate something. I could make an experiment that the the the, the owner doesn't know. The, the, those that gave us the the commission that's the project don't know. But I want it to appear sometimes and go away in other times. So I started work thinking about putting something into the panel that could show when it rains, when when there is humidity in the air, it stays, uh, it could, could show the, in, in, in negative the, the, what I put inside. So for example, the name of the, of the, of the company, INFN, or when it rains, it gets wetter first. And so it shows in a positive way. So we started working with that. And it was pretty interesting to find out that while we were in construction, this happened. Soon happened. In the image on the left, you see that uh, it shows in it had just rained. The first thing to the first thing to dry were, was well the concrete was thinner. And a few months after, in a sunny day, you could not see that. Every time you go in the morning, early morning in, win, in winter or or or, or uh, fall, you see in black. The opposite. You see the writing, and uh, when you uh, when you go after rain, you see in in white the right. And this appears and disappears. What is it for? Nothing. I don't know how I will use it in the future. But it's an experiment. It's a way that I like to use a building to learn something and to have something, so that my I don't know becomes something more. There is another I don't know in which I can put my things on top. And now we are working in this other. Um, uh, Winery. This is a winery for a very famous wine, uh, Feluga, Livio Feluga, a very good wine. And we are working with bigger panels. These, these panels are eight meter high and they are pretty big for our standards. And we, they are prefabricated and we are working on, the, on that project now trying to give a, a shape to this, uh, to this element. This, this is part of this, that same project. Now I, I'm at the last project in which I want to speak about structure in a different way. This building is is in the seaside and it's uh, in a urban area in the center of the sea, in a, of the of the town. And uh, we had we were commissioned to build a building that had a pod a, a basement in which there was a supermarket, and then to build on top of it, we were had to build some housing. On top. What we understood is that this is in Jesolo again on the east part of Italy, clo very close to Venice, very, very close to Venice. So we understood that everybody who goes to the seaside or wants to buy an apartment in the seaside is a, uh, wants to get the sun. It's like designing a building, a good building in the seaside for us was like designing a vineyard. Everybody wanted the sun for the longest time of the day. So we thought that we were using orientation south and we created a what you saw before on this plan, and a curved facade looking south, which everybody would get the sun. Of course, that would mean two things. First of all, a single loaded building. Second of all, a shape that would not work well with the organization of the pillars uh, that were going through the building and going through the commercial. So. The only there were two solutions. One solution was building a partition slab that was going to be one meter eighty thick. The second thing was going to work if we try. We went toward the second, the second. So if you see that this is the supermarket, plan of the supermarket, and you see we had the car. This was already sold before we we started work. So we had this line of column. And we couldn't move forward. But our building was curved. So what I was <laughs> saying is the shear walls that hold this building on top had to reach the, the pillars, the few pillars that have below. So the thing is, 
that we, we worked on was using this empty space as a buffer from where the, the, some pillars would go to catch their own pillar on the bottom. And this is the building. Uh, so this is what, what happened. So this shear wall go to catch the few pillars we have that go through the building and go down to the basement and to the garage too. And the other problem was having a single loaded corridor. So instead of having a closed single loaded corridor, which these are vacation houses, when you go in winter, it's always, uh, there is always a strange noise, strange smell or whatever. We kept it open. We are in Italy. We kept it completely open and we created a landscape outside that gave that created a way of getting to your building that is totally different. So this is the building under construction. You see these pillars that catch the loads from the from the shear walls and bring them down to the to the point. This is the view in which you see the the balconies that uh, distribution balconies. This is the building now. No, actually, now is totally finished. Now it's still construction. You see it goes down. And you see how the building actually wants to play with this, with this idea of the curve. It's a composition of, of volumes and uh, is a composition of colors that goes back to the, uh, to, to the idea of the nets. All uh, these are not, no, is no glass, is a uh, is, um, metal grid, met metal mesh. This is the building and, and This is how it's it's gonna. Now they are filling the swimming pool for to test it for the summer or whatever. And uh, again, you see that these pillars become a very strong scenography of the building. The building starts. The the space below becomes a a space where to stay, where it's fresh in summer, when you can stay, when your your kids can have a party. When in these periods of COVID, for example, you could have stayed. They are in having isolated islands where people could separate but stay in a, the same big place. We, we, we are still under, uh, now it's finished, but when I took the picture, we were, we were testing some lighting. And this is what's now behind. As you see, it's like a big net. This inspiration was uh, watching TV in Canada when they was seeing the fishermen from, uh, a, a program on fishermen from Newfoundland. And I saw these nets that were with this, uh, how you say, uh, floating, the, the floating orange elements that hold the, the net, the ball, the ball, and, uh, and this, uh, the colors. And uh, these elements here are actually some cabins that we put in the corridors where you put inside all, the, your, all the things you bring to the beach. So you don't want, sand. the apartments are pretty small, so you don't want to bring inside sand or, or things from, that are not that are not used in the into the house, but they're used on your side. So you put them is like storage for things to bring to the beach, and they became decorative element. And the space inside becomes uh, the space itself. It becomes pretty interesting now. It was under still under construction, and you see the space between the the distribution and the corridor is becomes a rich space. It becomes not just a space to move through, but is even a space to stay and to create a dialogue even between floors. You understand that in this picture more. And this is the last slide. And I hope I was clear enough on the, but please uh, make every question you feel. Thank you very much for your attention. And thank you, Silvio, for inviting me. Sorry, I didn't say it before because I was taken. Thank you, Stefano. So we're going to start taking questions now. So if you have questions, feel free to put up your hand or just type them in the uh, comments box. So Randy, uh, you had a question? Yeah, sorry, I kind of had it, but I wasn't sure on how to, <laughs> I was going to type mm -hmm. it or what, but uh... My my apology, uh, Stefano. Um, when you are um, 
playing around with some of these ideas when you're when you're experimenting do you build small mock-ups yourself like in your own studio to experiment with this uh some of these ideas like the stone was uh was great the stone to bob screen um you know and and the uh the freezing ice on the um on the on the wire mesh or, or the expanded metal is that something that yeah. you play with yourself in small scale yeah we we do a lot of models of every scale at every scale i don't show too much too many but there's a lot of rough modeling both uh, both conceptual at the beginning uh, that sometimes don't don't deal a lot with architecture sometimes in my office they look like art pieces, but they are actually experimentation things. Uh, some and but we do a lot. So we do both for the space uh, and for the use of material. We do a lot of makeups, mockups. Mock I live in the country, in the middle of the country, and lucky to have enough space to do things. Yeah. Sometimes my wife then gets mad about that and uh, calls someone to bring everything <laughs> away. But. Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. We do that. We like to do that. And uh, we see that uh, uh, once people, uh, even people, builders or uh, uh, clients uh, see that uh, they get involved, much more involved. And this uh, helps, uh, uh, helps them to understand this, helps, helps us to, to, to understand, but even helps us to, to talk to them. So we have something solid in our hands to, to deal about, talk about. Yeah, now the the models and stuff are are, are really great. Um, is he, have you ever published any of the mockups? Like I could see this the stone kebab almost being its own little art or jewelry piece. Uh, not on on themselves. We we do we have published in uh, in Italy. We have published a uh, kind of a lot in the architecture world. We are architects at the end. The artists, I think, are. Are another thing. Art, art, artists are, have uh, a sensibility that uh, I wish I had. Um, but uh, but uh, as architects, uh, after all, I, I of course I'm showing you. I always say this is like show, I show you the the, the the fun part of the of doing our job. But we all know that 99% of our job is shoveling shit. So. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the reality, and uh, but I yeah. don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about yeah. that. I want to talk about what uh, can push us uh, going forward and uh, mm -hmm. how we do. Now we made some buildings that are even bigger than the last one we did, but uh, there actually there was nothing really uh, intense to talk about. Uh, yeah. Sometimes uh, the the most experimental things you can do in a smaller building. We were yeah. kind of lucky this last one to have such a big building for us to to be able to experiment some things that for other people could be normal life, but yeah. for us was not. No, this is this is really great. Great eye opener. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hassan, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, that was a great, great presentation. I uh, really liked the the uh, kind of uh, not only uh, the composition, but also the rationality of, of uh, where the design is coming from. Um, so, uh, but but uh, just uh, from my uh, perspective as a structural engineer, my, my question uh, is, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the designs that you have obviously uh, follow uh, uh, a logical uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, process in terms of uh, even though they look daring, but they are uh, the, the, the structure is a rational structure. Do you get the feel as an architect of how the structure holds itself, or do you need to work uh, closely with the structural engineers at an early stage of the design? Um, let's say that uh, when I start the project, uh, when we start projects, even we, when I'm in uh, uh, in Toronto with uh, KFA, who I work with, I, I I'm uh, I get very uh, intense, so I speak about the project with everybody. So uh, either is engineer, friends, uh, artist, or whatever. I, I it, it becomes part of my way of my my day or my thinking, and uh, that 
that helps me getting ideas somehow and getting uh, and starting put putting things together. So it, of course, uh, among my friends are many engineers, uh, and uh, and when uh, when there is a something I think could be a problem or I think it will work in in a in a certain way, I ask. Uh, for help or I I'm I ask I always ask I really when I say I don't know is really I think uh, it is uh, uh, it is it is true I don't I don't really know I don't I don't I don't want to say I know this is very bad when you talk with clients because generally uh, there is one of my clients is listening now but she's a, a very good architect so I don't have a problem with her telling that but uh, uh, but I don't know I really don't know it's like I when I start working, I don't know where I end. And so I everybody is willing who's willing to help is welcome. <laughs> so so that's uh, yeah. that's how my, my way. So of course engineers are, are very important. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, actually I have one. Uh Elena, uh, Stefano, yeah, it seems that you would have to have a pretty special relationship, not only with your clients, but also your contractors in order to pursue such experimental uh, work. Could you, could you comment on where you get clients and uh, how do you uh, bring the contractor along for such experimental uh, adventures? I have to say, I have to say that uh, People need fun, and contractors need fun too. And if you, if you somehow explain them that you are not there to teach, but you are there to learn, and and that they they can learn, I generally I don't have big big problems. Sometimes it happens when people is lazy, but lazy people don't work very well. So I understand it pretty soon. People who wants to put their own brain, their own knowledge. Uh, they they help me. They they become part of the building. These buildings are are the composition in which I am the one that uh, somehow steers the steers the wheel. But I'm not the engine. The engine is the client. The engine is the contractor. The energy. The, when I talk about the energy of water, is no different than the energy of of contractor or of the client or of the money. Money is one of the energy. As architects, we have to deal, with. and uh, we cannot fight again. That's our our goal is to make people make money sometimes, uh, or spend a lot less money. So it's always a matter of understanding how to get there, how to, to change completely my project because a bidding was won by a company that I knew was not able to work with that material. That was really, really good. Another one it was not good to work with small stones, but they were masters of using huge stones. And so I changed the project somehow because you don't want to, you don't want to force uh, the camel through the needle. You say you don't. That's it. It's better to use to use the force that fight. So. My my attitude. Sometimes it doesn't. Work. Sometimes it didn't. I, I mostly so I forget those I don't. Because I always want to forget things because I if I had, after 25 years of uh, work, there are so many delusions that if you remember them all, then you stop become negative. So I, I want to forget. OK, uh, Stefano, that was a, a, a fantastic presentation. I'm just sorry that uh, it wasn't live and it wasn't in our office so that uh, it would be more interactive, but uh, it was just a, a great presentation and uh, um, just uh, hoping that uh, next year um, this whole COVID thing will be over and you'll be back in Toronto and uh, we can get together. Um, yeah. So. Uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you next year.